morning, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the series of webinars organized by the Computational Social Science Laboratory, Faculty of Social Science, the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Uh, I'm Bo Huang, a co-director of this laboratory, and I'm very pleased to chair this uh, webinar. We are very honored today to have Mark Adlemi here to give a webinar on mobility networks in cities. I appreciate that we can deliver the pr uh, presentation today, even after a hit by COVID-19, and the congratulations that we managed to overcome the hiccup very rapidly. I very much look forward to his uh, presentation. But before that, let me introduce him uh, to you. Uh, Mark is a physicist by uh, training. He did his undergraduate study at the uh, Eco Normal Superior Paris, which is quite famous in the, in the world. So in 1992, he graduated at the University of Paris Four with a thesis in theoretical physics titled Random Works in Random Media. Uh, he's now a research director at the Institute of Theoretical Physics in Saclay and a member of the Center of Social Analysis and uh, Mathematics at the EHESS. He applied uh, statistical physics to complex systems, complex networks, theoretical epidemiology, and also uh, spatial uh, networks. Uh, his current research centers around two main topics. One is uh, spatial networks, and the other is uh, the science of cities. And both topics are quite relevant to the themes of our, our laboratory. And he has published at least two books I found on the internet, which are, are made freely available on the uh, internet. And I have introduced them to our lab uh, colleagues. He has also has many papers published in top journals such as Pinus and uh, uh, Nature. It's really uh, great. So, without further ado, uh, please join me to welcome Mark. So, uh, Mark, the floor is yours. Okay. Please. Thank you very much, Bo. Thank you uh, very much, Tony, also for the nice invitation. And thank you for your patience. Uh, I was supposed to speak last week, but uh, I recovered indeed. And uh, so today I will, uh, you invited me to talk about mobility networks. And of course, I, I won't be able to talk about all aspects. So I added uh, selected topics. So I will, I will speak about um, a certain number uh, uh, of, uh, of topics. And I will start today by talking a bit about the structure of these transportation networks in particular um, uh, uh, about street networks and subways, which are indeed the most important in our large cities. Then I will talk also about, uh, um, yeah, after we know this infrastructure, or what's the pattern, or are people moving in cities? And we will see that, uh, of course, this has to do with the spatial structure of the city, and uh, uh, where we have many uh, activity centers. And the point is, or are we moving, in particular the commuters, or are they moving towards these activity centers? And of course, most of this, uh, in many cities, uh, uh, most of this commuting is done by car. So uh, um, this gives me the occasion to, to talk about this car traffic uh, problem and with the question, what, what is the determinant of car traffic? Why in some cities do we have a large car traffic and in others, uh, 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 much less? Uh, finally, if time allows, uh, I will talk about multimodality, uh, which is the fact that many trips, for example, commuting trips are done uh, using different transportation networks. And I will show uh, 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 all the framework of multi-layer networks can help us to describe this, uh, this problem. So let me, uh, let me first start with some, uh, uh, um, let's say, general introduction and just a, a few general remarks. Uh, first, about cities. Um, as you know, there are many different agents uh, uh, interacting and acting in a city from individuals to institutions, governments, etc. And all these different agents are interacting with each other at different time scale, different spatial scale. And these are really the, the ingredients for making the city a complex system. And indeed, this is what, we, what happens. We see 
uh, uh, emergent properties, uh, some spatial organization that was not planned, or some social organization with gentrification, for example, etc. We also see things such as mobility patterns and congestion problems that were not uh, 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 predicted before. And all this is because the city is really one of the most complex system uh, ever made uh, uh, by, by humans. And this has important consequences. In particular, I would like to stress that the naive modeling, if you put, let's say, everything in a computer about the city, this very likely is bound to fail. And I, I would like to insist on the fact that, for example, digital twins that people are very fond uh, nowadays are very dangerous. If you, if you try to make simulation without thinking about this complex system aspect, very likely you will have a, a simulation that is not able to predict the, the future of the city. So we have to be careful about this, uh, this uh, uh, naive modeling and we have to think about how to model a city and how we can make robust uh, uh, prediction, which, which is not a, a trivial thing. So that's, the, that's really, I think, the point of constructing a, a science of cities. It's how can we model cities and how can we make a robust prediction? Uh, of course, in this program, uh, a very important, uh, 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 let's say, game changer is the fact that we now have data for more than 10 years, almost 20 years, we have always more data about cities at many different uh, uh, scales. Uh, let's say from the GPS and mobile phone data, we, we have now data about commuters at an unprecedented scale. So we have a lot of data with a good accuracy, and this is really changing the thing. 20 years ago, uh, uh, urban economists were doing some theory about cities without data, basically. Now we have data, so if you make a theory, you can test your theoretical ideas against data. And I think this is really a big game changer. And this is the way we can progress in this urban, in this science of cities. I just would like to, to mention that, uh, uh, of course, we have to be careful with smart cities because of course, not all data is equivalent and a lot of data is not always useful. We really need quantity. And uh, 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 this, this means that we don't have to measure absolutely everything, but we have to think about what to measure and what will be interesting. So let me uh, uh, now start with the, uh, uh, the first, uh, the topic of uh, today, mobility network. And I will not insist too much, but of course, human mobility is, is crucial for many for understanding many processes. Of course, migration flows or people are moving from a city to the other one. And this is important also within a city for traffic. Can we, can we make traffic forecasting? And uh, uh, nowadays, of course, epidemic modeling. If you want to understand how disease can spread in a, in a urban area, you have to understand how people are moving uh, within this, uh, this area. So, uh, human mobility is really uh, uh, is really fundamental uh, uh, is a fundamental ingredient for uh, our large cities, and when you think about all these transportation means that we are using in cities, but at all scales, in fact, are usually structured under the form of networks. So, of course, street and road networks, where the intersection are the nodes and the road segment between intersection are the are the links. Uh, subway and railway networks are naturally uh, networks with station being the nodes, of course, and the links being the, the rail segment between two consecutive stations. And even air travel network, you can see air travel as a, as a network between the airports and the links being a, a direct flight. So all these transportation uh, uh, means are, are structured on the networks. And so mobility is really the meeting between the network, network science, let's say, and, and urban science. This is, uh, this is the inter intersection really of these two, these two things. And today, I will not talk about any type of mobility, but I will focus on intra-urban mobility. So we know that inter-urban mobility is very important. Actually, all the people are moving from a city to another seems to be extremely important for understanding population growth of cities and to understand the zip flow, et cetera. But that's not the topic of today. Today, we'll really focus on what we 
on few things we understood about intra-urban mobility, or people are commuting from their home to their uh, office. And this is actually the point, is the way we move in cities is connected to the spatial organization of, uh, of the city. If you have a city well organized, let's say, people can choose where they live and where they work, and then have a small commuting. So really the, the commuting and, and consequently congestion problem is really a signature of the spatial organization of the city and its efficiency, you see, also. Uh, we, 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 can, we could imagine that the uh, efficient city is a city that reduces the commuting and where uh, in the end, you know, the, the real estate market is such that we can live where we would like and so on. Of course, this never happens. There are, very, there are, there are many constraints and, and, and concurrency, et cetera, so that the fact that the, the organization is never optimal and we always have a, a congestion. But we have to bear this in mind, the spatial organization of the city is really, uh, uh, gives rise to many different processes and congestion, for example, traffic congestion is one of the uh, resulting emerging, uh, uh, emergent property. So let me then start with a, 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 a few things about the structure, and I will focus on the, the road network and subway network. Uh, I will not detail everything, but about the road network, there were many, many papers, and I think we have a good understanding of the road uh, uh, structure. Uh, there are many ways to characterize this, this graph, this network. We can look at the blocks, the angle distribution, I will say a few words, the, the betweenness centrality, which is an important quantity for social network, is extremely relevant for road network. And uh, uh, even recently, we saw uh, uh, some attempt to construct the typology of road networks. And I will, I will speak in more detail uh, uh, about this uh, uh, these attempts of making a, a families of road networks. But the main message here is that there are many different measures and we understand this network quite well. I mean, we, we can characterize its structure quite well. And for example, here I just reproduced the, the, the angle distribution, which is a very simple quantity. And uh, you see here the, uh, um, the, the polar histogram. So the, the radius is the probability to have a street at a certain angle. And you see that, for example, in Manhattan on the left, you have most roads are perpendicular to each other. So you really have two directions. And this is, of course, in contrast with uh, uh, Boston. This, this uh, picture we're taking from Jeffrey Boeing's uh, work. In Boston, you see it's a much more messy city with uh, streets in, uh, uh, at all directions. And in fact, you see that this simple representation tells you already a lot about the, the, uh, the city. And in fact, uh, uh, Jeffrey Boeing uh, uh, did some, you know, constructed all these polar histogram for all cities. So the most ordered one are, are Chicago, et cetera. And then you go on the, on the, on the bottom right, the, the most disordered here, you see Rome, for example, Singapore, et cetera. Uh, uh, so this is a very nice, simple representation and tells you a lot about the organization of the streets, if you have really purely rectangular or something more complex. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, just as a, uh, as a simple example, I, I zoomed on Hong Kong. And uh, um, although I don't know very well Hong Kong, but you see here that um, you have uh, streets in most, uh, in all directions with a dominance maybe uh, for east-west uh, roads. But you see that, uh, uh, I won't discuss in detail all this, but it's just to tell you that we have many measures and even simple measures such as the angle distribution can tell you already a lot about, uh, uh, about cities. And this brings me in fact to the important problem of trying to construct a classification of a, a street network and more generally spatial network, which are networks embedded in space. Can we construct families of, uh, of, of street networks? And this is important of course for urban morphology studies, but also uh, in many fields uh, such as botanics, where you try to make some classification of leaves, uh, construct families of plants, etc. So, and uh, here is an example. This is taken from the book of uh, uh, Stephen Marshall, uh, who did a lot of work in spatial syntax. And the idea is really, we have samples of uh, the road network of many different cities, 
can we construct families? I mean, is, uh, is Glasgow uh, in the same family as Copenhagen or are they different, etc.? So that's really the, the, the main question here. How can we do that? Uh, and um, uh, it has also, uh, it was studied in many uh, other fields. And this is an example of uh, people studying um, spider webs. So on the bottom, you see different uh, uh, spider webs. And these are made for spiders uh, under the influence of different drugs. And you, you noticed, for example, that this is, this is the spider who took some caffeine. And uh, you see that the web is uh, <laughs> so unbelievably messy, much more than uh, marijuana, for example. And, and, and the, the question here also is, can we visually, it's obvious, uh, but uh, how can we quantitatively make families of, uh, of these different networks? What's the main difference? And um, in fact, the, uh, 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 there were different approaches. Uh, the, the first one in developed in space syntax is mostly subjective, and I won't discuss it too much. Uh, in mathematics also, uh, uh, people discuss how to describe a planar graph, and it's a it's uh, they constructed some bijection to a, to a tree. So this is also uh, difficult to apply. Um, maybe more useful for practitioner uh, uh, this approach developed by Cathy Fori and Mileiko uh, some years ago, uh, where you, you try to remove more and more edges in the, in the network and you construct the tree, which represents all the different blocks are merging together. So again, I won't insist on that uh, today, but uh, 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 this is not perfect, but at least you have a simplified representation of the, of the network. And uh, uh, we also looked at the statistics of size and shape of blocks. Uh, this also tells you some information. So you see there are different approaches. I, I won't talk about all of them. I just uh, make a little selection. Uh, but it's a very important problem, and if you succeed in making uh, having a nice method for making families of uh, uh, of street networks and more generally spatial network, that's a that's a very important and useful thing. So let me uh, uh, let me uh, I will insist uh, today on the latest method, which is machine learning approach. I think which I think is interesting. Uh, uh, it was developed these years, uh, last years, uh, by uh, uh, Thompson in Australia. And just let me sketch the idea. They took sample maps uh, for almost 2,000 cities. So the small samples of, uh, of, the, of the map of cities. And they were using these samples to, uh, 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 to uh, uh, feed the neural network. So there is some uh, machine learning algorithm they first uh, 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 tried the learning phase, they gave these samples. And after this learning phase, what they were doing, they were testing the algorithm. So they were presenting two sample maps of different cities. And either the algorithm says, look, these are different cities, then that's done. These sample maps were recognized, that's okay. Or in some cases, the algorithm was unable to distinguish the two sample maps. So, in fact, the, the algorithm was saying, okay, look, uh, I don't know if these are very different. I'm, it seems that they are in the same city. In this case, what Thompson et al. did is they constructed then the, if this happens for a sample, let's say from city I and another one from city J, they put a link between I and J, meaning that these cities are similar. If the algorithm is not able to distinguish them, it means that they are similar. And so, in this way, they constructed the confusion matrix, what they call the confusion matrix, which is really some kind of measure of similarity between cities. And once you have this confusion matrix, uh, you can use whatever clustering algorithm you like uh, or community detection uh, uh, algorithm. And they found finally nine types of cities from these 2000 cities. So they were really, they were really able to make nine families and I will show you some examples here uh, uh, with some uh, representative element, for example. So they gave some name to these different uh, uh, city types. Here are the five uh, first one. Uh, uh, so they gave the name informal, irregular, etc. And here are some little sample elements. And uh, 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 here are the, 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 the other, uh, the four last one. 
And so it's, it's very nice because in the end, they are able to make a classification of uh, cities or family of cities. Then you can say different things for these families. My problem here and what I would like to stress is that they have no clue why we have these nine uh, um, uh, uh, classes. And so really the limit here is how to interpret the results. So we really need some explainable artificial intelligence. So I believe that meeting traditional, met more traditional methods, let's say, with uh, machine learning might be the future. Uh, how can we interpret these results? How can we understand them? And I think that's the, that's the path to construct a typology of street network. So I will, I, will, I will stop here for the street network, but uh, just the point is that there are some methods going towards the, uh, the, uh, the construction of families of road networks and therefore families of, of cities. So let me uh, uh, now jump to the problem of subways, which are somehow uh, simpler as you will see. And uh, just uh, some, some, some background, here is the length, total length of a subway, the total length of uh, railways versus the construction date. And what you see is that, in fact, most large cities, they have a subway. So very old one can be found in Europe. So one, one point here is one city, in fact. So you see uh, uh, some, uh, some subway in Europe and North America, in New York, probably London, Paris, etc. And the most recent and large one can be found in Asia. Uh, uh, so in China, uh, in, in, uh, in mostly in China, actually. And uh, here you have a much smaller and recent uh, uh, subway. But it's really, it's something uh, that you also have to, to have in mind is that once, basically once a city crosses 1 million inhabitants, more or less, a subway is appearing. So it's really something which is part of, uh, of cities. And what we see is uh, uh, about the structure is basically this one. This is a very rough classification, but uh, this is basically what we see for small subways of total length, 10 kilometers approximately. It's basically one line. So for smaller cities, you have one line, possibly in some cases, two lines crossing, uh, sometimes with fork. And what happens is then when the network is growing uh, 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 about 100 kilometers total length, you see a, a loop, either a ring or two lines making a, a, a loop. And uh, uh, for much larger networks, you see a more complex structure with uh, branches and a ring, et cetera. So that's the, that's the typical evolution when the, the subway network is growing. And uh, actually for very large network, and this is what we did some, some years ago, uh, uh, when, uh, uh, let's say for the 15 largest network in the world, uh, subway network in the world, we, by inspection, you see that they in fact converge to the same structure. And the structure is this one, is basically made of a, of a core. So you have some ring structure and inside a, a denser network and branches radiating from this core. This is really the structure that we found in all the largest uh, networks in the world. And not only the structure is the same, but the, the, the features of this network are also the same. For example, the, the fraction of, of station inside the core is about 50% for more or less all the network in the world. The size, the typical size of the, of the branches here over the size of the core is typically of order two for more or less all uh, networks, et cetera. The, the number of branches, for example, if you ask yourself, uh, what's the number of branches uh, radiating from this core is actually scaling like the square root of the number of station. So if you have 100 station, it means that you have more or less of order 10 uh, branches. And so this works for all the largest uh, subway in the world. So, and uh, this remarkable convergence uh, uh, can be explained qualitatively. So there, uh, um, actually, there is a clear meaning of these elements, of these components. For example, the core, of course, is made to, to allow a good communication inside the city, basically. This corresponds to the center, center of the city. So it, has, it needs to be dense in order to be able to, to transport people easily from one 
point of the city to, the, to another one. And of course, the function of the branches uh, is to bring people from less dense area to the center. So the, the function are very clear. And so we understand qualitatively why we have the structure, but so far there's no dynamical theoretical model explaining this. And moreover, what is clear here, and, and we'll see another example uh, uh, that's the case, that there's a coupling between the population density and the evolution of the network. And uh, uh, we don't have so far a clear theoretical model describing this, uh, uh, this coupling. And uh, let me skip this. <clears throat> and in fact, uh, uh, the question more precisely is this one is uh, suppose you have the network properties, simple properties such as the total length, the number of station, the number of passenger per year. And this is really describing roughly the, the network. And on the other end, you have uh, properties of the city. So the population, the area and, and the density uh, and, uh, and something measuring the health, the wealth sorry, uh, of the city. So the, what we call the, the gross metropolitan product, which is basically the wealth per capita in the city. So you see that you have network properties, uh, socio-economical properties for the network, or are these two related? And, and that's, that's the simplest question. I'm not talking about equation. I'm just talking about what's the relation between these different quantities? And so in principle, we would like to, to write some, some let's say, co-evolution equation for the population density and subway network structure, but this is a completely open problem, surprisingly. Uh, uh, what we can do is some a simple cost-benefit analysis, which basically states that the, uh, uh, the, on average, the, the maintenance cost and construction costs are balanced by benefits. Uh, uh, with the fare or things, thing, things like that. And if, if you do that, I don't enter the detail, you can find some relation, nice relation. For example, if you know, uh, uh, this is uh, the plot predicted, the straight line is the prediction of the simple cost benefit analysis. And you plot the, the number of passengers per year in your subway network versus the number of station times the density, average density. This is predicted by the theory. And you see that it, it works not too badly. Actually, you have the trend and dispersion is not horrible, which is not a trivial thing if you think about. If you give me the number of stations of your subway network and the average density of your city, I'm able to tell you what's the number of passengers per year. Uh, so that's not a, a trivial thing. And it works relatively well uh, with this simple cost benefit analysis. And uh, uh, of course, uh, 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 it doesn't give you everything. Now, if you want to understand how many stations I have in a city, the natural thing is to connect this to the, the, gross, uh, the gross product, so the wealth of the city, roughly speaking. And you see that here, the cost benefit analysis gives you a, a, a simple prediction, which is this line. And you see that we capture the trend. That's OK. But there is a large dispersion around this. So uh, probably we can certainly improve this. So at this point, I think it, it, it's fair to say that we are not really able to predict if you give me the wealth of a city, we are not completely uh, able to predict with a good accuracy what will be the number of station of, uh, of the subway. So you see that there's still, there are still many problems in this uh, understanding of the, of the subway, the subway network. There's, there's, there's largely a lot, of, uh, a, a, a lot of room for improvement. But at least we, we understand the, the, the main thing of this uh, subway network. So now let me go to another subject. I tried to convince you that, well, we, we, there are some problems left, but we understand the structure of the street network. Uh, uh, the subway is also relatively well understood, but now, uh, uh, people, for example, the commuters, they go, they use these different transportation modes. And what's the typical pattern? Or are these people in large cities moving to the activity center? And here, activity center, I mean where people are, go, are going to work. And uh, uh, I will uh, first discuss uh, what's the structure and cities of these activity centers, and then all, all commuters are moving towards these activity centers. 
irrespective of any transportation mode. And uh, let me just make a, a preamble. So uh, I guess you all know that, but a revolution in these studies were really mobile phone data. And I will not enter in date, uh, the details here, but it's really a, a new and fantastic source for studying cities. And basically, once a phone communicates with antenna, you know the location of the closest antenna. So we are able to follow uh, the movement of people. And in fact, we can also, from the mobile phone data, reconstruct the home of individuals and also where they are spending the day, which means that we are able to reconstruct uh, the so-called origin destination matrices. So we are able to construct the flow, for example, the morning, the commuter flow, uh, uh, where people are going to work. And this is really unprecedented. Before we had surveys, which were not very accurate and, and, you know, and, 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 and difficult to make. Here, we have a lot of data. We know how most people are moving towards uh, uh, their, 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 their office during the day. And this is really a revolution. And here are some uh, uh, very simple example. Uh, we're just looking at the density of users, how many users are in some cities. Here, uh, these are Spanish uh, cities. So, and what we observed is that basically you have two families of cities. You have cities which uh, have a, a monocentric core, uh, uh, which means that during the day, people, most of the people are in one area, which is one activity center. And these are, of course, smaller cities. For larger cities, you see that you have more than one activity center. This is what we could call polycentric cores, which just means that you have more than one activity centers and uh, people are not going all to the same uh, area, but they are different areas. And in fact, thanks to this data, we can measure the number of activity center. And what we observed in the data is that the number of activity center is scaling with the population to some power, which is typically of order one half, which is what we say sublinear, which means that if you multiply the population by two, the number of activity center is not multiplied by two. There's some kind of threshold effect the population needs to get bigger and bigger. And at a certain point, a new activity center will appear. So the, the, the thing is that this result is, uh, is like a guide uh, uh, to construct the theory. It, you have, we have to understand this result, uh, what governs this, this exponent. But uh, you see that the uh, simple measures uh, with uh, mobile phone data tells you a lot about the spatial organization of cities and, and where people are going to work. Um, so the, the point here is how can we explain that? Here again, I will not enter the details, but we can construct a simple model uh, with some ingredients coming from urban economics. And uh, uh, the important point here is that this little model includes a car traffic congestion. And the, the main idea is the following one, is that if you have one activity center, everybody will go to the center because it's the most attractive one. But at a certain point, this uh, center will be very crowded. I mean, it will be difficult to get there because too many people are already getting there. So what happens is that at a certain point, a less attractive center, another center, which is not so attractive, uh, uh, has the advantage of not being crowded. So at a certain point, you know, there will be some discussion. Shall I go to the very attractive center, but very crowded? or shall I go to work to a less attractive center, but not so crowded? And at a certain point, when the population is large enough, congestion will be too large. Many people will switch and go to the less attractive center. And this will create new activity center. So it's really the idea in this model that congestion is really shaping the structure of cities. And actually this model predicts that uh, uh, the number of centers above a certain threshold before you are monocentric, there's one center, and above the number of center grows with a, a population in a sublinear way, in agreement with the data. So that's very nice. But the main idea is that congestion is a very important driver uh, uh, for uh, uh, governing the number of activity center. 
So that's the, 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 the first uh, uh, idea. It means that for large cities, we have many centers. Now the question is, or are people going toward this center? You know, what's the, what's the mobility pattern actually? And uh, for example, here I reproduced uh, all the uh, picture drawn by uh, the economist Alain Berto and uh, uh, some time ago. And for example, showing that commuters are going to one center or moving randomly or, or, or moving to these two different centers in the polycentric city, et cetera. But this at this time, was extremely subjective. There's no data, you know, backing this up. So the question here is, uh, can we say something more? And uh, the answer is yes, thanks to mobile phone data, we can see how people are moving to the different centers. And let me try to, to sketch the idea. The first thing to do is to simplify the problem a little bit. And what we'll do is that we will distinguish homes uh, in, two in two families. Uh, first, uh, uh, we will uh, um, uh, distinguish the, let's say, what we call residential hotspot. So basically, very largely dense, uh, very dense uh, uh, residential areas. So basically, there's, it's not a mixed area. This is where people are living. And uh, from the rest, so you have these res residential hotspots and other area which are not, which are more mixed uh, land use, there are some residents, but also, you know, shoppings, etc. And we can do the same for working areas. You have the, the very strong activity center where almost 100%, you know, is, is uh, devoted to, uh, uh, to, the, to, to, to work, to offices and the rest. So, so it's, it's very crude, of course, but once you have done this, then you can simplify the commuter flows. Some people are living in these uh, uh, residential hotspots, let's say, and uh, work in these uh, uh, activity, very dense activity center. This is the flow I, let's say. Uh, in contrast, some other people are living in some mixed use area, let's say, mixed land use area, and go to work to, uh, uh, to uh, these activity centers. This is the flow C, let's say, and so on. And you can also construct the flow of people, of commuters living also in, in normal area, not particularly residential or, or activity center and working in some also mixed land use area. So here you simplify, you, we only have four different types of flows and you can measure this for each city. So, and this is what we did and here is a presentation of these flows. So uh, green are residential hotspot, uh, uh, the blue are the activity centers and the gray area is just mixed. So here you have the R flows going from one point to the other one. The I flow is going from a residential hotspot to a, a activity center. And so you can measure this for the for very large urban area. And this is what we did some time ago for uh, Spain, for the 30, uh, 30 largest urban area in Spain. And so we could measure these flows. And what's the most important? And uh, uh, the result was a bit surprising. And uh, we did this in particular with Mike uh, Batty and uh, UCL, and we were really surprised by the result because the, uh, here we plot the importance of these flows versus population. And what you see is that when population is growing, there is one flow which dominates all the other. It's the flow called R, which uh, represents uh, uh, about 50% of all the commuters and which are these kind of random flows from any area to any other area in the city, which really means that we are very far from the picture of you know, flow converging to some center. No, it seems that the larger the city, the more delocalized the commuting, the mobility patterns. It seems that you know, we have to forget about this, uh, this picture that we, I also had, you know, where people converging to some center. No, the most dominant thing for a large city is the, the, let's say the, the most truthful image would be uh, the one of random movement. It seems that you know people are moving kind of randomly. There are no clear dominant routes in the, in the city. So that's an important result, which was confirmed in, uh, with other data uh, for the UK. Uh, uh, of course, this, this would, we need to check this on other cities, but 
just be careful with you know with this preconceived image of a monocentric city, etc. No, a large city is much more complex and appear to be much more random, in fact. So let me now, uh, uh, for the time uh, left, uh, is that we, we understand these movements, uh, we have some random movement, etc. But we know that uh, 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 depending on the country and the city, most of this commuting is done by car. And the car traffic is, of course, a huge problem in all cities in the world. And so oh, can we? what is driving the car share? Why people are taking their car or the subway or, or something else? So how can we understand that? In particular, what's the influence of the urban density? And uh, uh, for this part, the last part, I will uh, 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 first discuss this result published in the uh, 89, the newman Kenworthy result. And it's a very nice plot. It shows the, um, the gasoline use per capita, so by in, 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 due to car, versus the urban density. And you have this very nice curve starting with low density areas like in the, in the, in the US, people are taking a lot of the car and the density is very uh, uh, small. Mid uh, size, let's say mid density uh, areas like in Europe. And then uh, uh, the best one in this case is actually Hong Kong uh, with a very large density and a very small use of, uh, uh, of car. And the problem, and so th this, this curve, this plot had, had a huge impact on urban planning because then the, the, the quick conclusion would be, well, if I would like to improve the density, the mobility, if I would like to reduce the, the car use, I just have to increase the density. It seems that, you know, large density cities are, are doing much better. But of course, uh, there are many problems with this curve. First, the data is difficult to get almost impossible. In fact, it's very difficult to reproduce this curve. This is also a problem. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, in addition, there's no theoretical foundation. How can we understand this? What, what would be a nice, simple model to understand that? And the problem is clearly stated. You have a population P. You have a certain area A, let's say. What's the car traffic T? So the question is, is well posed. How can I, can I do this? So we, we worked on this problem uh, uh, recently and uh, we came out with a, the simplest model, uh, uh, which is this one. Uh, imagine that uh, 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 I have basically one quantity, which is the probability to be in the vicinity, to live in the vicinity of a subway station. So let's say less than one kilometer. Typically the idea is the probability to be able to walk to, uh, 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 to the subway station. And P represents therefore as connected to the density of your uh, 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 subway network. Let's talk about subway. Uh, so the larger, the denser the subway network, the larger this probability P, which means that wherever I live, I have a, a, a subway station very close to, to my own. So then in this model, uh, uh, things are very simple. With probability one minus P, so I'm living in X, I would like to go to the office. With probability one minus P, there's no subway station. So in this case, there's no question, I take my car. This is the simplification, the simple assumption in, my, in, my, in this little model. With probability P, I have a subway station in, the, in my vicinity, in the vicinity of my home. So then what I have to do is that I have to compare, oh, okay, I, I can go by subway to my office, but I can go by car. In this case, uh, the individual will have to compare the cost, the cost, of course, the financial cost, but also the cost, the trip duration. This is what is called the generalized cost in, uh, in economics and transport economics, which combines both the financial cost and the trip duration. So, and then what happens is that you will take the, the, the less costly uh, uh, transportation mode. So this is the simple model that we do. Uh, I skip all details, but you, then you can compute uh, the number of people, uh, the fraction of people taking the car, this uh, T, and how it varies with population. And so we get a complicated equation, but uh, uh, of course, which uh, happens to simplify. And what happens is in the end, we have a very simple result, is that for large cities, when the city becomes really too large, congestion effect, are becoming very important. And 
the only people in this model who, who happen to take the car are the one not in the vicinity of a subway station, which means that for very large cities, it happens in this model that if you are, if you are close to a, a subway station, you take the subway because anyway, the car traffic is so bad that subway is always better. And this mathematically translates in this simple equation uh, that the number, the, the number of people taking the car is basically the population of the city times one minus P, which is the probability of not having a subway station in the vicinity of your home. So that's a very simple result. And of course, uh, once you have a result, and this is really the philosophy I, I, I try to develop here is that whatever theory you can make now, you have to test it against data. Unless what was done you know, 30 years ago, we didn't have the data, so you could make some theory without testing. Here, you can test it. Um, unfortunately, the, the value of P, the priority to be in the vicinity of a subway station is not easy to get. We, uh, we got it uh, two years ago for 25 cities in the world. And then you can try to plot it. And here is the result. And you see that I plot the share uh, T over P, which is the fraction of people taking their car versus uh, this uh, probability P. And uh, the red curve is the prediction. So there's no tunable parameter. It's a, it's a super simple model, but there's no tunable parameter. And here we represented the different cities. And you see that despite the simplicity of the model, uh, it works relatively well, in fact. Uh, of course, you have outliers because, you know, for example, in Buenos Aires, cars are too expensive. People are taking other transportation modes such as bike, Etc. This is not in the model, of course, but you see that such a simple model with such a simple result is actually quite robust and predicts, you know, for, for many cities, uh, you know, for Paris, for example, 50% of the population is, uh, uh, is close to a, a, a subway station. And indeed, it corresponds to 50% of people taking their car. So it's, it's remarkably accurate, uh, surprisingly, I would like to say. And in addition, this model allows us to compute the, the gasoline uh, uh, consumption or the CO2 emission, which is more or less the same. And I, I will assume it's, it's the same. And from this simple model, actually, the quantity of emitted CO2, uh, you can make the calculation and you find uh, this expression, which is the product of three factors, and which tells you that the, the emitted CO2 is first uh, related to the public transport density. So if, uh, if, if P is very close to one, for example, you have a lot of subway, then this quantity will be small, of course. It's related to the area of the city. A is the area, square root of the area is, is the length, actually. And there are some congestion effect. This tau is larger than one. It represents congestion effect. So what we see here, is that in contrast with the newman kenworthy problem result, this density is not controlled by the density. It's the product of three factors. If you take, just a little word, if you assume that all the, the cities, these large cities uh, have more or less the same population, square root of A is behaving approximately as one over square root of density. So if you go quickly, this tells you that very roughly, the quantity uh, uh, of CO2 emitted is going like one over square root of density, which could explain why Newman and Kenworthy could have seen in their set, in their sample, this type of, of behavior. But it tells you, this is more important, that increasing the density is in general bad. Uh, because when you increase the density, you mostly increase the congestion effect. So assume that you have a city, just let's increase the population at fixed area. This very likely will increase congestion and will increase the CO2 emission. So what you have to do, in fact, is to uh, um, uh, actually increase this P, so the coverage due to public transport. And this will have an effect. So, and this is a quantitative basis to the so-called uh, transit-oriented development. You have to increase density, not at random, but around subway station, or equivalently, you have to increase the number of, of, of stations. But 
uh, this was to show that a simple model can help you to understand determinants of, of mobility and that you have to be careful with purely empirical results that can be extremely misleading and, and give you false ideas. So I think that now, uh, uh, and in here, this is, sorry, yes, this is the check of this CO2 emitted. You see that, of course, you have, uh, so this is the complicated expression we get, we got. This is the data, the emitted CO2 and due to transport. We have the trend. Given the simplicity of the model, we have the trend. Of course, you have dispersion uh, outliers. For example, you see that New York, again, is, is far above the CO2 emission in New York City is extremely large. Uh, 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 on the other hand, Buenos Aires, due to other transportation mode, is really below our prediction. But at least we have a, a trend, and then you can work on this model to make it more complicated, if you like. But at least we have the uh, we have the trend. So uh, 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 let me. Uh, I, I have still five minutes left, more or less. So let me finish with multimodal uh, uh, trips. Uh, because now that we understand the, the structure of networks, the, the mobility patterns, and uh, 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 the car share uh, uh, in these large cities, we know that in many, uh, in many cities, actually, a commuting trip is done by using different transportation modes. For example, you take the car, you park your car, and then you take the subway. So you are using different uh, modes, and this is called multimodality. And a convenient way to represent uh, this problem, to describe this problem, is, is by using what is called multi-layer networks, which means that you have different layers, and each layer is a network, a specific network. For example, uh, one layer is the bus network, one other layer is the metro network or the rail, and you can do that for all the transportation modes you have. And of course, you have a coupling between these different networks, which means that you can stop from the bus and walk to a subway station. So these different networks are coupled to each other. And uh, of course, we, you have to be careful is that the wall is not a big network. You really have different dynamics inside each layer, coupled usually by walk. And so you cannot represent uh, this system by a large, huge, homogeneous network. This is really a multi-layer network each layer has its own dynamics and they're coupled to each other. There was a lot of work on this, uh, on this problem. You can develop new tools, new characterization. You can look the, the spread of disease. You can look at whatever you want. Uh, I point here to a review uh, uh, in 2014. There was a book published by Ginestra Bianconi uh, uh, three years ago, a very nice book. So this is really a, a, a hot topic. And I will just discuss a few very quickly, a few things. Uh, first, you can try to measure, and this is for London, the importance of different modes. So here, this is the fraction of different modes versus the, the length of a trip. And you see that for very short trips in the greater London, you are mostly using the bus. But then for larger trips, you take a, a, a part of the trip is made by metro, the, the rest uh, with bus. And for longer trip, the rail even appears. So you can, you can look at this type of things and it tells you uh, uh, what's the relative importance of the different transportation mode. And maybe more interesting, <clears throat> sorry, you can, you can see how much time for a given trip, how much time it takes to stay on one layer, for example, taking the bus, then how much time and how much time you spend waiting for another bus. So this is what we call the intra-layer weight, so it's in blue. And of course, when you take, uh, you go out from the bus and go to a metro station, you have to wait for the subway. And this is the, the inter-layer weight, and uh, etc. And so you see that typically for a trip of about 20 kilometers, um, here uh, you have a, a non-negligible uh, waiting time. Uh, here, typically, uh, the trip of about one hour, you have uh, you know, almost 20 minutes of wait, uh, total wait in this, uh, in this system. And you see, you can, uh, uh, this is very interesting. You can see the, the anatomy of trips and all people are, are in the best case are taking the different transportation mode. So this is a very nice uh, uh, view of the system. And you can even try to characterize the, the efficiency of the system. Uh, for example, 
uh, you can compare two different types of, uh, uh, of trips. For example, uh, you can uh, in blue here from two different points in, in London, this is the quickest path. So it means that it's a very theoretical path. It's if uh, 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 synchronization was perfect. So you take a bus, you go out from the bus, you go to the metro station, you, you get immediately the subway and so on. So this is a theoretical quickest path if synchronization was perfect. But of course, uh, uh, in life and uh, reality, things are different. And you have to take, uh, if you take into account departure and arrival times, you have to take the, the best path is not this, this theoretical quickest path, but it's another path. So we, we call it time respecting, means that you respect the timetable, the arrival and departure time. And so the comparison, for example, of these two different paths can tell you something about the efficiency of the, of the system. If these two different paths are not so different, it means that your system is not too bad. And in fact, what we, we saw is that, uh, how can we improve the system? How can we reduce this difference between the theoretical quickest path and the time respecting path? And the simplest idea would be to, uh, well, let's improve the frequency of transportation modes. Let's put more buses, more subways, and this will naturally improve the synchronization. And what we saw is that indeed it improves the, the system, but very slowly, which means that you have to make a huge effort and a huge cost uh, in order to see, to get sensible, I mean, to get some results which means that in fact, it's not a good idea to improve blindly the frequency of, uh, of subways and buses. It's not a good way, uh, I mean, it's not an efficient way to improve the system. And this type of relatively simple measure on these uh, networks uh, can, uh, can help you to find the best strategy, which probably depends actually on the, on the city and the origin destination metrics, et cetera, but it's not improving blindly, you know, increasing blindly the frequency that you will uh, arrange things. Now, let me just discuss another important point about multimodality. And here I will illustrate this on the coupling between two modes, uh, the car traffic, let's say, and, uh, and subway. And uh, we discussed this at that time on, on New York City and London. And here we represented on the uh, uh, this is uh, London, and so you see the subway with subway station. This is Manhattan in New York. Uh, so people can drive, and at a certain point, they can stop and take the subway. And the point is, what is the best, uh, the best uh, 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 multimodal combination for them? And the question is, if we improve the subway, the faster subway, for example, nicer subway, will it give less car congestion in the city? That's, that's the, the question. And for this, as I told you, we represent, uh, we are using a, a multimodal, multi-layer network. So one layer is the street network with a certain average velocity. The, um, the subway network is, uh, is another layer. And we assume that the subway is faster, where beta is the ratio of velocity. And of course, people can stop the car, take the subway, move in the subway and so on. And so we can study what happens when this beta, when the velocity of the subway uh, uh, varies. And this is basically what we found about uh, 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 car congestion, car traffic. On the left, uh, on, on the top, you have uh, uh, New York. On the bottom, you have uh, London. And here on the left column, you have a very slow subway. So it's not super attractive to take the subway. And what you see is that uh, the darker areas here are uh, uh, related to congestion, to car traffic congestion. So you see that indeed the congestion is, is relatively delocalized. You have traffic problems a bit everywhere. Uh, okay, that, that's it. Uh, now it, on the right, we assume that the, the, the subway is super fast, super attractive. Then the pattern of traffic congestion is different. And you see that some places uh, are actually uh, uh, um, you know, congested, and uh, and it's the same. It's the same for New York and uh, London, and these points here with large congestion correspond actually to the entry point of the subway, which basically means that in this case people are driving to the nearest uh, station, 
and in order to get as, as fast as possible, as soon as possible in the subway and then take the subway. But then you see immediately the problem is that this coupling induces traffic congestion at the entry point of the subway system. So now you can ask yourself, okay, but what in terms of total congestion, what happens? And this is the, the schematic of what happens. Uh, so on the x-axis, this is the subway velocity. So, and here we look the total road congestion. And what happens in this case, in particular for London, is that when the subway is more and more attractive, more and more people are taking the subway, that's fine. It reduces the, um, the total congestion. But at a certain point, when the subway becomes very attractive, then people are really, uh, uh, you start to see a lot of congestion in the entry point uh, of the system, of the subway system. So people are really going to park. They want to park to the nearest uh, subway station to take the subway. And in some cases, this, this was the case in our simulation for London, in some cases, the total congestion due to this entry point is increasing again when the subway velocity uh, increases, which means that there is an optimum. And this is very important. It means that uh, you, you cannot do whatever you want and make the subway always more attractive. This can have consequences and bad consequences on the car traffic. And in some cases, it can even have the, the opposite effect of what you wanted. And this is really to illustrate the importance of coupling between tr different transportation modes. So if you want to make a simulation about the effect of a new train line, for example, you cannot forget about car traffic because this, uh, this will have a huge impact on the car traffic. These two transportation modes are coupled to each other. People will have the choice and you cannot make an argument by isolating one network. These networks are really coupled to each other. And if you want to understand what will happen, you have to uh, consider everything together. So this was my point, last point I wanted to do. Let me conclude now in the last uh, minute. Uh, just a quick recap. I think about the structure, everything is known of these mobility networks. Uh, the, their time evolution is a bit more complex. There, there's this famous problem the population density of cities evolving, transportation network will evolve too. What's the coupling between these two quantities? That's, that's still, I think it's fair to say it's an open problem. We don't have a clear theoretical view of this. I also told you about the, where people are working in cities and the spatial, I think now the spatial structure of cities is, is relatively well understood. The larger the city, the more activity centers you have due to congestion and people will go to these uh, activity centers. But surprisingly, the larger the city and the less dominant routes you have. Actually, the larger the city and the more random appears the movement, there's no clear dominant route. So you have to take this into account uh, for transport uh, planning, for example. And then if you focus on the, on the, on the, on the car traffic, the, I think it's safe to say that the newman kenworthy result is wrong. You cannot just think about the, the, the share of car traffic uh, as, as a simple function of urban density. That's, that's not true. Uh, and um, an important parameter is actually the, the density of public transportation. That's really the parameter on which you can act on. You have to increase the density around this uh, entry point of the public transportation system. And then I finished with this multi-layer approach showing that a simulation with one transportation mode is basically useless. Um, so I, I, I really tried to, to show you, you know, mixing different simple models, you know, data, of course, testing your models against data is super important, but simple parsimonious models uh, with the smallest number of parameters can be extremely useful. And I think that for the future, machine learning, of course, for application will become very important, but uh, ideally, I believe that we have to combine these two approaches in order to understand what machine learning is giving you. The simple models can really uh, give you some robust uh, result and uh, some, let's say, physical understanding of the city. So I, I believe that's the way to go to understand this, uh, this complex system. 
And on this, I, I, I stop and I, I thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mark. It's fantastic, uh, very insightful uh, talk. I really appreciate that you see through many complex urban phenomena and then come up with uh, Pasmonia equations and models to explain the complexity of those uh, phenomena. So now the, the floor is open for uh, questions. With pleasure, of course. Okay, here comes a question in the chat window. Uh, uh, maybe in the chat. Um... Uh, yes. Uh, standards of the large cities. I'm I'm not sure what you mean by choosing standards of the large cities. Uh, the um, here the the one difficulty was actually to uh, uh, so in in general in most studies we we decide to take um, I don't know if it's what you had in mind but uh, uh, the definition of urban area which is not the administrative definition so I don't know if this this is what you had in mind but. Uh, the city here is really the urban area, meaning the usually the central core plus uh, the surroundings uh, uh, from where people are commuting to the central uh, core. So uh, the and for this definition of city, which is really the urban area, actually. So for example, in the US, it's the metropolitan uh, statistical area. In 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 Europe, we have some. Uh, uh, OECD uh, type of definition of functional areas. This is usually what I use for, uh, for definition of the city. And in this case, if you are able to, um, this is what we got for the 25 uh, 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 cities. In this case, we can measure the probability of having, uh, uh, of being at less one, than one kilometer, let's say, of, uh, uh, of a subway station, which means that you can walk to the station, the, the average in, in France and Paris, for example, is 400 meters. Every 400 meters, you have a station. But here we, we took a one kilometer and for all these cities, we got the data. So all the cities shown here, we got this data, which is not super easy to get. And uh, cities meaning urban areas, and this is uh, what we got. And uh, and indeed, I mean, it, 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 it confirms the idea that uh, um, that there is a simple relation between car traffic, uh, I mean, the car share and population, which is simply given by the, the, the access to, uh, to rapid transit, to, uh, to uh, uh, tramway or subway. It's, it's, it's in the end, it's as simple as that. You know, this curve is really, we, uh, it, it's surprising that first we started with relatively, if you look at the paper published uh, two years ago, we start with relatively complex equation and we end up with this surprisingly super simple result. Uh, but you know, that's life. And but this super simple result with no tunable parameter is really working well. So it really seems to show that indeed, if you in most large cities, if you take the cars because you don't have the choice. Yeah, thank you. Then uh how same place. Okay, yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Mark. Uh, oh. Thanks for a very, very inspiring talk. Can you hear me? Yeah. So this yes, is house yes. uh, from actually from Belgium, so close to, to where you are now. So I have a, um, the, you have a very inspiring talk and I, I learned a lot from here. And I especially like your approach of basically using simple metrics and also mathematic model to, to analyze complex kind of phenomena or, or systems. And you use a lot of data. And at the beginning, you mentioned about the data quality, or maybe we need to pay attention to the data. And my question is really related to about data quality. So you basically you get the data from, from different countries, different cities, and this basically have different data quality. And now normally, how do we actually deal with such kind of data quality in your research? Do you also try to consider the data quality and consider such aspect when you try to develop the mathematical models? Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, uh, well, I, I agree, and 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 you know, and uh, it's it's a very important problem. I mean, the 
uh, for example, we um, we we uh, we saw that uh, mobility, in particular, mobility data is a key ingredient for epidemic modeling. That's at all scales, at at the at the country scale, at the urban area scale, etc. And what we observed is that many operators open the data. So you have mobile phone operators. You also have uh, Google and other companies opening their data, and you. In fact, what you see is that there is a huge diversity and huge discrepancies between the different operators. So that's that's really a big, big problem. I mean, I'm talking only about mobility here, but the, the problem is more general, in fact. And in principle, uh, if you have a strong result, it would be in principle uh, necessary to compare, uh, to check, to cross check with other sources of data. And in general, coming from one source, I mean, using the data from one single source is a dangerous game. And actually, we saw even some recent paper published in, uh, you know, Nature or, or, you know, for example, talking about the COVID, for example, Jure Leskovec published this important paper about uh, the importance of restaurants and, and bars, etc., and the spread of COVID-19. But the, the source of data is unique, basically. And, and that's super dangerous because we saw that depending on the operator, depending on the way you are capturing the data, the result can be extremely different, even for simple quantities such as the, I don't know, the displacement distribution, et cetera. So I think that in, in future studies, we really have to pay attention to that, especially for theoretical studies. Um, uh, it, it's a huge problem. And uh, ideally, again, we, we should cross-check the result with different data coming from different sources. But that's a, that's a very important problem. It's not only related about the quality of data, but uh, uh, it's also related about how you, you actually um, uh, extract and get the data. And, and in fact, the complex system, when you think about it, the complex system is difficult to model, but also, we have to be careful when we measure a complex system. And the way you are measuring a complex system can affect the data. So we have to be, for example, you know, uh, uh, measuring the mobility through users, you know, uh, could depend a lot on how the users are moving around in the city, etc. cetera. So um, we have to be extremely careful about that. And that, that's a, that, I think that's the most important problem. Uh, another, let's say, problem, but this is not really, you know, for us practitioners, but it's, it's the fact that there's a lot of useless data anyway, you know, for example, you can measure, uh, I, I remember I, I've seen stuff about Songdo in, in, in Korea, in South Korea, you know, they, they are measuring a lot of data with sensor and captors, the number, you know, the, the quantity of water used every day, etc. But this is totally, you know, useless data, basically, we we know basically everything about that, and it won't help you uh, uh, understanding the city. So we have to be careful because you, you spend a lot of money installing, you know, sensors, captors, etc., to in the end get a, a huge amount of data, but which is totally useless. So um, maybe you also have to think a bit uh, more about, you know, what, what we would like to to measure and. When it comes to mobility, again, it's 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 a very tricky problem. Uh, things are not as simple as they they seem, and uh, there might be some you know some artifacts and some uh, some problems with the way data is collected. So we have to pay attention. How is the data collected? Could it induce some bias? And so we really need to understand well all the data is collected in order to be, let's say, safe about our result. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, next question asked by Yue Bing Liang. I should read out, otherwise it cannot be recorded. So hi, Mark. Uh, thank you for your inspiring talk. I'm quite interested in your idea about the necessity of considering multimodality and you provide an illustrative example of London metro lines. I wonder whether there are some quantitative ways for us to model the interaction between different modes. Um, oh yes, I, I think that uh, uh, now there's a, there's a whole literature 
uh, about multi-layer networks. And uh, I, uh, I advise you have a look on the uh, ER the reference. So this is this is a review we published some time ago in uh, the Journal of Complexity, I think. And, and more recently is this book uh, uh, published, I think, in, in Cambridge uh, University Press by uh, uh, Ginestra Bianconi. And in these books and reviews, and, and more generally in the literature, what you will see is that we can define some coupling. I mean, we can define quantitatively some coupling between different uh, layers. For example, there, there are very simple quantities. Uh, uh, think about, for example, the proportion of, uh, of a shortest path. I mean, you can extend the between the centrality and look at the proportion, the fraction of shortest path using two modes or a single mode or things like that. And for example, if the fraction of shortest path using at least two modes is large, this gives you an idea how strong is the coupling between the two modes. If you know, if 90% of the shortest path are using two modes, it means that you know whatever you do on one uh, layer will impact the other one. On the other hand, you know, if the coupling is 10%, meaning that uh, just a few percent of shortest path are actually using the two modes then here uh, the layers are more or less independent and what you will do on one layer will not affect the other one. So th this is one example, but there are many, many measures about uh, uh, how to define the coupling between uh, these, uh, uh, these uh, networks. And from the data, it's also easy to extract, you know, how many people are using two modes, etc. So uh, uh, I, I cannot detail everything, but I really I strongly advise you look in these books and reviews, which are, which are freely available on the, on the archive, all the review and the, the different papers. And for example, people looked at simple processes such as diffusion, you know, or is, or is information or, or disease spreading in, in multi-layer networks. And so the, you will see that there are many quantities defined uh, uh, to describe the coupling. So there, there's a lot of work to do. And uh, again, I, I point you to this review, which is maybe the simplest uh, or, or the book, you will find all the references. If you have a more specific question, I'm happy to answer, uh, send me an email. Yeah, thank you, Mark. So next question by David. So how about the further deduction from a dynamic perspective? My question is that in terms of polycentric city, how do you define the activity center or determine the number of activity centers quantitatively? Since that the, the definition and the location of uh, activity centers could affect the following discard patterns. Okay, so uh, could uh, you please share some details? Uh, I, I, I'm okay. I, I'm I'm not sure about that. It, it seems to me, if I understand well, I mean, uh, does it mean the first is the question is, do you have more people in these cities? So that's the first question. Is the number of commuters increasing or not? Uh, that could be. In this case, you know, you are going to saturate both roads and uh, and uh, and transit subways. Or uh, do you have an increase of multimodal trips? So people are taking the car and um, park their car somewhere and taking the, the subway. So I think uh, you have first to, um, uh, to measure the, um, the origin of this increase. You know, uh, It's not always easy to measure, but in order to understand uh, this problem, uh, you have to know if you are dealing with a, no a constant number of commuters or not. Uh, that's the, the first thing I would see, uh, you know, if you have more and more commuters, you can saturate both things, you know, and stay at, uh, at the same modal share of car, for example. But uh, if the number is, uh, the total number is increasing, it, it will increase everywhere. Or is it due to multimodality? So I think there are some, uh, uh, some measures about the number of commuters and their, their multimodal, uh, the multimodal trips to, to be made before concluding. Um, then, depending on the answer, then you can say something. But here, you really have to identify the cause uh, of, of the problems. But I know it's difficult, you know, just to give you an example, in, in Paris, France, uh, uh, some years ago, uh, the mayor decided to close some kind of urban uh, uh, freeway. In the middle of Paris, we have some kind of uh, freeway. 
And uh, the mayor decided to close this uh, segment of a uh, highway and no one, no one agreed, I mean, no simulation could agree on what would happen after the, the closure of this, of this freeway. So it's, it's a simple system, right? Uh, I mean, simple question, you close a segment of freeway, what will happen? And uh, some people said, well, it will decrease the total traffic. Some people will drop their car and take the, the subway. Uh, some other people said, uh, no, no, no. Uh, people will stay with their car and they will find the alternate uh, routes. You know, they will go uh, on other streets. And so this will impact the traffic in the, the neighborhood. And the, the worrying thing is that we were not able to, uh, uh, people were not able to make a, a clear simulation with clear results. And four years after, we are not even sure about the, uh, the impact. So in the end, you know, the, this, this freeway was closed. And four years after, so was it a good thing or not? Well, we, are, we, we have captors, you know, we have uh, pollution captors, et cetera, in Paris, but no one is in fact able to say, yes, it was a good thing or no, it's not a good thing. So uh, I'm, I'm at this point, I'm a bit pessimistic about this complex system. We need, we still need a lot of theory and, and good data, meaning, you know, we need more origin destination matrices, et cetera. We need more data to, to address these problems. And, and uh, so, and, and Beijing, which is, uh, and Guangzhou, which are even much larger than Paris, you know, I, I can imagine that the difficulty is even larger. Um, so I would really start with simple measures as much as you can to try to answer uh, uh, or to understand what's going on. Yeah, I agree with Mark very much. It's uh, quite a challenge for urban planning to take account of both the uh, average static situation as well as the uh, dynamic situations. That is quite uh, challenging. So yeah. next a question from PhD student, Tan Xinye. Uh, thank you so much for your insight for sharing. Uh, my question is that in terms of polycentric city, how do you define the activity center or determine the number of activity centers quantitatively? Since that the definition and the location of activity centers could affect the following discovered patterns, could you please share more details? Um, yes, that's a, that's a very good question. The, um, in fact, uh, uh, what, we, what we know from the data is the density of users. So you can see, you can see the city as a surface, you know, with the, representing the density of users. In some places, there are more users. So it's a kind of local maximum. And what you want to detect are these uh, activity centers, which means that you have a anomalous large density of users. So meaning that, you know, in some area, number of users is kind of normal. And then there's a peak. There are many users somewhere. And so you have to detect, uh, from a technical point of view, you have to detect these local maxima. And how do you detect the local maximum? So it, this has been discussed uh, a, a lot in the literature. And uh, we actually, uh, let me find the corresponding, uh, yes, I think it's in, the, um, yes, it's in this, uh, in this paper and the paper before, uh, uh, with uh, Thomas Luai, we published a series of papers where we are actually proposing a non-parametric method. And the idea is that the, the, the thing not to do is to say, for example, where the density is larger than the average, I consider it's an activity center. But the average is absolutely not good. So you have to find a threshold. What's the threshold above which you consider that it is an activity center? And so you have to determine an activity center and the idea in this method proposed in the, this nature communication and, and the companion paper in, in scientific reports is, is to, to determine the threshold as a function of the heterogeneity of the density of users. So it's a bit technical, but there is a clear, uh, clear way to determine the good threshold in order to identify the particularly dense region. That's what we want to, to know. The activity center will be the super dense region, so to speak, the hotspots. And so this is one method to determine the hotspots based on the heterogeneity of the density. 
uh, and I, I think it's very important to, uh, uh, I cannot give you all the details here. I can send you the paper, of course, if you want, uh, but uh, it's, it's very important not to use a parametric method. I saw some papers, there were some previous papers about polycentric system. They were taking some, you know, density of population, for example, they were using a threshold. Let's take this threshold and everything above this threshold is, you know, a maximum. But that's, that's in fact very wrong because you have to adapt the threshold to the situation and a, a, a good threshold for a city could be a very bad one for another city, et cetera. So uh, I think it's very important to find a non-parametric method, uh, which means a method where you don't tune the threshold yourself. We need an objective way to define a threshold above which the, uh, it is an odd spot or not. And this is what we did in these papers, but uh, there may be other methods now. But uh, the method is all here in the Nature Comes in 2015. 15 and the, the, the scientific report 2014. Uh, drop me an email if you, if you want. I can send you the, the, the reference. Okay. Yeah, uh, next question by uh, Tony. So are there software apps uh, already on the market or public domain for analyzing coupling between multi layers of uh, networks? Uh, in, in fact, uh, um, indirectly, I would say yes, in fact, because when you are, for example, if you look at um, uh, applications such as uh, Google Map, for example, Google Map, if you, if you ask, you know, what's the shortest, what's the quickest path from one point to the another one, it gives you an answer mixing different modes, you know, uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, mixing buses and subway or railway. So it already mixes actually in the algorithm, uh, it's already mixing the different layers. Uh, uh, so in fact, extracting the data from uh, Google map could tell you already a lot uh, about the coupling between the different layers. If you see that, you know, assume that you take two points, two random points, look the quickest uh, uh, path between these two points. You can do that for many points, many pairs, and you could look at the fraction, let's say, of, uh, of these uh, quickest paths that are using more than one transportation mode, two modes or three modes, for example. And this is already a very good measure of the coupling. So it's an it's a indirect way to extract this information. So, but uh, now if your question, uh, uh, Tony, is really, is there a specific app computing this? I, I, I haven't seen some. I don't think so. But it's really an information that is out there in the end. All these navigation apps, they, 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 they are doing this calculation, in fact. So, uh, so it's a matter, it's, it's to us to extract this, but it, it exists already. For example, there was a, a nice study, um, well, already some years ago, for example, people tried to, to see or uh, or uh, 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 for handicapped people, or, or user friendly was the the UK network, if I remember well. So they were looking different points, and using Google Map, I think uh, they were checking if the what was the the quickest path for handicapped people. And for on a wheelchair, for example, you cannot take uh, uh, the stairs, etc. And and the, the app was computing the shortest path taking into account that you need a, an elevator, et cetera. And then you could look at the difference between the quickest path for disabled person and the quickest path for non-disabled person. And so the ratio of times disabled and not disabled would give you an indicator of the quality of the, of the network. So you see, you can go very far using um, already existing apps such as Google Maps and others. I, I don't know what you are using mostly in, in Hong Kong, but uh, 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 mostly the data is out there and we have to extract it from, from these, these apps. But a specific app, no, doesn't exist uh, as far as I know. Yeah, uh, actually I'm teaching GIS for transportation costs. So you're better than that. Uh, no, 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 no. I don't mean, I mean we can use uh, ArcGIS to create a multimodal network data set, com combining the different modes of transportation networks. 
Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you could, you could do it yourself, indeed, absolutely. Yes, mm. yes, it's true. It's true yeah. for your particular city, in fact. And you could even measure really in a nice way and defining different coupling for different cities, you know, and, and comparing cities in terms of which are the ones more coupled, et cetera, absolutely. And, and you know, the thing is that it's true that most of these studies, you know, the coupling is used, is usually compute for a random pair of points, but like the betweenness centrality or other quantities, but it would make more sense to follow the origin destination uh, matrices. So if you know where most people are going to and coming from, you know, you could adapt the measure of coupling to the, to the actual real flows of people. That would give you a very interesting measure of the coupling, uh, uh, not theoretical coupling, but the coupling for, for people actually using the system. And that, that, that's, I think that's even the next step and would be uh, very nice to see. Yeah, so many things revealed by what Mark has done cannot be done by using ArcGIS. It can just simply generate the body model uh, network. Okay, uh, yeah, and next question by uh, Liu Baoju. So I have two questions. One is how to consider uh, competition and the collaboration between different travel modes in modern uh, layer networks. For example, buses and the subways may compete and the working and the subways may be collaborative. How traffic congestion affects human choice of travel modes and uh, routes? That's, um, that's uh, of course, an important question, which was discussed a lot in, uh, in transportation economics. And uh, one way people are uh, describing human choice when you have two modes, is to use what they call generalized cost. And the generalized cost, it's, it's, it's something very simple, in fact. It's that if you want to make a trip, this trip at, at a certain uh, distance, and uh, uh, for a given transportation mode, it will cost you some money. So if it's the subway, for example, it would cost you the, the, the subway ticket. If you, are, if you take the car, it will cost you, of course, the gasoline, but also, you know, you have to take into account that the car is costing you something uh, for the maintenance per year, et cetera. So anyway, whatever the mode, there's a first part in the generalized cost, which is the financial cost. So this is the first thing. When you want to do a trip with a certain mode, you have to compute the financial cost. Then there's another term, which is the trip duration. For some mode, for subway, it will take you, I don't know, an half an hour. With the car, it will take you one hour. So uh, 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 the generalized cost is actually mixing these two information, the financial cost plus the trip duration. And actually, you see that there's an important quantity, which will be the cost per unit time. And this is called the value of time. And this simply means that for some people uh, with a large value of time, for example, for these people, usually richer people, they don't care about the cost. They want the shortest, the quickest trip. Some people, uh, on the other hand, they don't have the money uh, uh, and uh, they cannot afford uh, expensive uh, 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 trips. So uh, they pay in some sense with their time. So they will uh, make a, a very long trip. It will be long, but less costly. So the generalized cost, is interesting quantity, uh, you can, for a given trip, you can compute the generalized cost, financial plus uh, uh, time, uh, trip duration, for two modes. So it gives you for mode one, uh, quantity C1. For mode two, it will give you quantity C2. And then basically, humans will choose the less costly mode in general. So in fact, you can even make things a bit more complicated and introduce some noise. Uh, there's a probability to take mode one if the cost one is less than, than C1. Uh, in the studies uh, I presented you, I, I simplified the problem and I said that if the cost one is less than cost two, I take mode one. So I take the less costly mode, but you can add some noise and add some probability, uh, but that's, that, that's just, it means that instead of taking a heavy side function, you could smooth out the function and take some you know, logistic curve or whatever. But this is 
or you deal with uh, in a simple way with the human choice between uh, between travel modes. It's really a combination of how much will it cost you and how much time will it take. Then of course you can <clears throat> you can try to include other things, you know. But uh, uh, at least uh, uh, this gives you, you know, it's a simple way to to describe this quantitatively. Then you can like your own comfort. For example, people are taking their car because they like to be alone, uh, to listen to music, or etc. Uh, we saw that with the COVID in, uh, in for example, in Europe. Uh, surprisingly, you know, uh, the, the the car traffic was increasing because people were afraid to take uh, public transportation because of the COVID. So they want that they, they took in the end the car because they they found it safer. Um, so, of course, there are many, many different factors affecting your choice for travel mode, but a, a safe way to start is to take into account the money and the time of the trip duration. And this, again, is generalized cost in transport economics. There are probably wiki pages on this and, uh, and uh, a lot of, uh, large, there is a large literature that we cite in our paper, but uh, uh, you will find this easy. Yeah, fantastic. So, any more questions? Uh, I have yeah. one, actually, if I may. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah please. Hey, Mark. Uh, thank you for the uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, the, the talk is fascinating, interesting. And I just, I'm very curious about the, uh, I know you mentioned this non parametric method of defining the different hotspots, but would you expect the, the conclusion uh, is going to be different? for different urban contexts. Like in Hong Kong, we may be expecting many center to center, a hotspot to hotspot commu uh, the commuting compared to the, the city you use. Do you have, uh, have you tried the data from other cities or countries to sort of uh, revalidate this, uh, this interesting finding? Um, uh, of course, that's a very good question, and uh, and we would like to 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 see if it's uh, general or not. The, uh, for this, it's simple. You just need you know you just need uh, in fact some mobile phone data. Once you have the mobile phone data, you can test it. But unfortunately, mobile phone data is not so easy to get. Um, but uh, I would be extremely interested uh, uh, to see that for other cities. There is one point, though, is that in order, you know, in your method to, to, to identify activity centers and hotspots, there's still a matter of, uh, of a spatial scale. So a hotspot cannot be something super large because then it, it, it doesn't make really sense, you know, hotspot has typical size of let's say 500 meters when i mean it must be a walkable to to be able to talk about a center it must be something you can walk in basically you know that's the rough idea so uh, in areas where the surface is smaller it can be a problem you know to to really speak about different centers so I, I'm not excluding that, uh, well, I haven't been in, in, in Cologne or in, you know, for a long time now, so I don't know how it is now, but uh, uh, I, I guess that for the particular case of uh, uh, Hong Kong, I'm not sure that you could distinguish different activity centers in a small area. It, it, I mean, this has to be checked on a you know, case by case uh, basis. Um, but again, we, um, we didn't do it on different uh, countries because the data, the, the phone data is not that easy to get. That's as simple as that. But uh, I think that, uh, yes, it, 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 would, it would be nice to see it. But again, if the spatial scale is reasonable, I mean, if you have a large urban area, I, I, do, believe, uh, I do believe that indeed, you know, a nice, uh, I mean, the cities, the urban area, Develop their transportation system, etc. And I, I, I think, I mean, my intuition tells me that uh, this random movement, the delocalized movement, are indeed the dominant one. Uh, I, I think it's a, it's a very strong result. Uh, but um, now, on, on smaller area, again, it's not guaranteed to, to work, of course. And moreover, <laughs> I don't know exactly the geography of. Uh, of Hong Kong and where the commuters are coming from, etc. So I don't, I, I don't know exactly all that. So uh, it has to be, it has to be checked. But 
you know, now with some mobile phone data, you know, even if you have a, a you know, small sample of the total population, I think you can say all these things. And once you define the activity center for which we have a, a clear method, a non-ambiguous method to define the activity center, then I think it's relatively simple to do. I mean, uh, these ICDR flows are easy to define. You aggregate the different flows and you see how much percent it is. And, and it can tell you if you are uh, more, in, maybe it, you are still in some monocentric case where everybody is going, you know, in some very specific area in Hong Kong. I don't know, you know. I don't know, but uh, uh, I, I think uh, I haven't done it, but I, it would be nice to see. And it's just a matter of data, of course. Yeah, it'll be interesting actually to compare different kind of cities and to see whether, how, how like what's the percentage. Do you remember the percentage uh, of people who are commuting non-centered to non-centered? If you can go back to the graph that you- <clears throat> Yes, here. Uh, yeah. uh, here, uh, it's 50% more or less. Well, it's growing with population, but you know- Wow. Uh, it's uh, starting from 1 million, it's about 50%, you know, more mm. or less, 40, 50%. So it's really one half. And the rest, actually, the second more important is this high flow going from very dense residential area to very important activity center. And so these are the little uh, circle. If you see them, this is high. It's, you know, for the larger cities, a little bit above 30%. So it's really 50% of random movement. 30% of very localized, I mean, people working in, you know, really strongly residential area to activity centers. And then the rest is more or less noise, uh, people converging to center or things like that. This is really noise of order 10, 15%, let's say. And this seems to be the trend when you are going to larger and larger cities. And, uh, but even for smaller cities, you know, the <clears throat> if you look the cities less than 1 million inhabitants on this plot, we are still in the same ballpark. I mean, the, 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 the green and yellow are still below 20%, so it's basically noise. And you have a mixture of uh, these uh, uh, random, uh, uh, so the, the two important components seems to be the random movement and these uh, uh, very strongly uh, residential area to activity centers. Th this seems to be really the two flows that make a city. The rest is, is basically negligible. Thank you. Uh, Mark, we still have two more questions. Is that okay for you? Of course, yes, yeah, yes, okay. yes, of course. Of course okay. So, a last second, I have a question about the first part. Could you give more details about the determinants of identifying city streets other than street angle? How to distinguish cities with similar angle distributions? How is the accuracy? Oh, yeah, yes, I, I think the, the um, yes, I, I was a bit quick on this, but there are many, uh, uh, many different uh, um, uh, ways to measure the angle distribution is not enough, for sure. Um, you can measure, for example, the, an interesting thing is the distribution of blocks. I don't know if I, if I have it here. Uh, let me just quickly, if I, uh, give me one second. Uh, uh this is my uh oh, let me just go quickly i think i i, sh I have it somewhere i'm sorry uh, uh here for example uh blocks you know um um here for example uh, uh, uh the angle distribution is not enough and you can look other quantities and here for example instead of looking the network on the left you could look at the blocks so the, which are delimited by the roads of course and in order to characterize a block, uh, you can at least uh, use two quantities, which is the area of the, uh, of the block, and also what we call the shape factor of the block, which is a very simple quantity. It's the area of the block divided by the area of the circumscribed circle. And so it just means that it's one when you have a perfect circle. If you have something very elongated, a strange block, it will be very small. So here are examples. You see that uh, for rectangles and uh, square, it will be of order 0 0.6, let's say. For strange shape, it will be 0 0.3 or 0 0.2, you know, very small quantities. And what you see is that uh, this is the distribution for, um, for, uh, 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 for German cities made at that time in 2006. Uh, and you see that you have a, a dominance of, uh, of uh, rectangles, 
So many blocks are rectangles or square, and then you have other strange shape. And actually this quantity tells you a lot about the visual structure of the city. And uh, I don't know if I have it here. Uh, so this is, this is a, another example where you see the distribution in, in two different cities in New York, for example, you can distinguish between large and small blocks. Uh, so you see here that uh, the difference between New York and Tokyo is in fact Tokyo, uh, you have many small blocks, while in New York you have many large blocks. And the large blocks, they are, you know, uh, uh, peaked around 0 0.4, which is kind of, you know, some rectangles. And uh, the smaller blocks, they have all kinds of possible shapes, which, which is signaled by a, a broad distribution of, uh, of this shape factor. So I will not insist on this, but you know, so you have the angle distribution, you can look the size of the block. And then there are other quantities uh, uh, such as, uh, I think, which are the most interesting, which is, for example, the, the betweenness centrality, which tells you where are the bottlenecks of the, of the system. And, uh, and uh, this is, uh, I believe, very important and uh, very useful. So the, the betweenness centrality was first developed in social networks to, uh, to identify the important nodes in the network. But it seems that for the street network, it also helps you to identify bottlenecks and critical points in the road network. So you can just compute the, the betweenness centrality on your graph, and this will tell you where are the important points in your road network. And that's a very, where they are, and the spatial pattern of uh, central points uh, is a very important and, and uh, clear characterization of, uh, uh, of network. Of course, then there are, you know, there are many, many other uh, uh, ways to, um, uh, to characterize uh, 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 the, I, I won't, I don't have the time here, but uh, uh, I, uh, in the, uh, I, I wrote a book, which is Morphogenesis of Spatial Network, which is out two years ago, and I wrote an extended version with all the possible measures, but you, you can find on the internet, on the archive, uh, I wrote um, uh, physics reports, which is called spatial networks, and you can find many different types of measures on your road network. So, uh, uh, um, but you know, the block size, block shape, angle distribution, uh, uh, um, you know, and between the centrality, you know, you have three, four indicators. If you know them, you already have a very good idea about, uh, you know, what, what, is your, uh, what is your road network. If you show this to someone, you know, will tell you, okay, I have an idea if it's a regular lattice or absolutely not, or a regular lattice plus some, you know, some strange uh, uh, lines. This is what happened in Paris, for example. You know, Paris was first a regular, almost a regular lattice. And in the 19th century, we had what we call the Osman works. Osman uh, was some, uh, uh, some important guy at the time. He decided you know, to connect train station, etc. And this is why in Paris, we have these big, huge avenues, which are not following the lattice geometry. And this creates blocks which are elongated triangles. This is why in Paris, you have, you know, strange shapes for some buildings because you had to follow, you know, these large avenues, you know, the, the, the Champs-Élysées or whatever, which are, you know, really cutting in the, in the geometry of the lattice. So the, the shape uh, distribution and all these uh, quantities tell you that actually. And uh, so I believe that we have enough quantity, three, four, five, at least to, to describe relatively precisely your uh, your your road network. Yeah, thank you. Maybe a last uh, question. Uh, actually, a second uh, question from uh, Xinye Tan. Uh, when we uh, when we characterize human mobility or quantity flows between different areas or locations, how do we select or define the basic uh, spatial or temporal scale or unit? to measure. How will the scale affect the analytical results, especially the temporal scale? Um, yes, so um, I, uh, I mentioned it, but 
it, it's maybe a, a, a good a good moment to emphasize it. I, I spoke basically about commuters. So it's really commuters in the morning. Uh, so this depends a bit on the city, but you have, a, of course, the traffic is time dependent. It starts uh, in Paris, it starts at, uh, let's say, 7 a.m. and has a peak around uh, 8, uh, 8, 9 a.m. and then decreases after, you know, until uh, 10 uh, a.m. or so. So basically, uh, uh, um, uh, what we have, what we did in most cases is some aggregated view, you know, in the morning. So the total number of commuters in the morning, let's say from, from roughly from 7 to 9 a.m., let's say. So, but... Uh, it's not a dynamical, uh, what I presented this morning it was not a, a dynamical view of commuting. You, I mean, that's another question. How can we predict the evolution in time? Uh, that's another problem. I was mostly interested in the aggregated number. What's the total, let's say, number of commuters in this specific, in the morning, let's say, roughly speaking. But it's true that, I mean, you are correct in if you go, want to go further, we should, you know, understand the time behavior, and it's probably uh, uh, it's it will probably become something more important because um, I don't know how it is in, in Hong Kong now, but in Europe for sure, uh, uh, the way we work will change. So remote working is uh, is now uh, discussed in many companies and will become. Uh, a lasting thing. So many people now will work only, you know, um, uh, will work at home at least, you know, two, three days uh, per week. And uh, they will be able to choose the moment when they want to go to work and the day. So, you know, this old image of old picture of commuters in the morning and rush hour in the morning and rush hour in the evening very likely will change in, in, many, uh, in many countries, many cities these next years due to remote working. So for sure, we will need you know, a more uh, temporal view and uh, all this stuff about rush hours, etc. We probably will have to revisit this. And, and more generally, let me finish on this, more generally, uh, um, the, the space and cities, I mean, cities were made because of space, you know, because people wanted to be together so you can specialize in your own function and exchange things with other people. And this is what led to, you know, to the aggregation of many people, I mean, of course, simplified, but this is what led to cities, you know, people go, wanted to be in the same place. And uh, uh, now that we can work, you know, in different places very far away, uh, this uh, probably for the first time in history uh, will has the potential to change the function and the structure of a city. So uh, there, there, there are many, many debates about the post-COVID cities uh, uh, and remote working. Um, uh, uh, I don't know exactly, but moreover, it's aligned with uh, uh, climate uh, uh, warming. Uh, so, I mean, all these things converge to the fact that we have to drive less, uh, to uh, pollute less, etc. So, um, um, you know, space, time, and cities uh, will change, and we probably will have to revise, you know, everything we know about cities is potentially changing in the next uh, decade or so. Yeah, thank you uh, very much. So in, in the interest of time, I guess we have to come to a close of this uh, uh, webinar. So I wish to thank Mark for the fantastic, uh, very stimulating, thought-provoking talk. I enjoyed it very yeah. much, very enjoyable. I also like to thank the officers for also the Zhejiang Yu team for arranging this talk and all the participants for your uh, participation of this uh, uh, webinar. Thank you very much and wish all of you a nice spring festival. <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah, thank you very much, Mark. And we hope to invite you again. I believe you still have more materials to share oh, with us. <laughs> yeah. With pleasure, yeah, pleasure. Yeah. I think thank it's soon the, the new year in China, no, it's soon the Chinese New Year. So Chinese New Year. Yes, yes, so yes. I wish you a very good new year you know, and all the Appreciate best. You. Yeah, thank you, thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you very much for your invitation. Thank you. Oh, welcome, welcome, welcome.
See you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. 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 Bye.